J Baba, all my love to all of my friends at Avatar's abode and other places down under and Oz and uh, anywhere else uh, from which you may be watching this video. I'm very pleased and honored to have this opportunity to take part in the uh, 2021 Avatar's abode anniversary celebration. Talking here from my house very close to Marabad with my friends Naman and Twisha who are helping in the uh, videoing of this program. The uh, topic uh, today is going to be relating to Francis Brabazon's great epic masterpiece, Stay With God, uh, which is going to be getting published in a new edition. Uh, I wanted to talk today uh, about some of Francis's uses of references, cultural and literary and historical references in Stay With God. Uh, anyone who has read the book uh, would be very well aware of Francis's really extraordinary erudition and uh, the use he makes of it in this book. Uh, the new edition of Stay With God is going to have a glossary, which along with the notes that he himself put in, uh, will help readers to find uh, w what these references are, where they come from, and what some of what their significance is. Uh, but I thought for today, I would pick out just a couple of them and try to flesh them out somewhat. Uh, Stay With God makes use of these references not in a name-dropping way, not like that at all. To the contrary, they are powerfully charged. And when you know what Francis is talking about, um, it really uh, adds great intensity to his poetry. So I wanted to illustrate that through uh, several examples. Um, w this could actually be the topic of a, like about five hours or 10 hours of uh, discussion, but I'm just going to give a few examples here. Uh, a bunch of them where I'll be spending a good part of this uh, will be his use of Shiva and Mount Kailash and the Kailash Temple and Allura, in Allura, the Allura Caves, his poetic use of it. It's a light motif in Stay With God that's really quite important. In, a, in fact, it comes up in the very opening lines, pulling up the opening lines of Stay With God here. I'll read the first opening stanza. Wings toward the glaciers of Kailash, where the first fathers nourished the seed of God, and Shiva gentled Ganga, and Parvati walked by streams of living heart. For Shiva was Jesus before him, and Parvati his loveliness in the earth, as was Rama, as was Krishna, as was Abraham, and Zarathustra, and Buddha, and Mohammed, and their loveliness, God's avatar, as is now Baba. Sing, Baba, your descent this time on earth, your brightness in our night, your comfort in our separation. Quite a magnificent opening to his epic. It's the epic convention of calling upon the muse, so to speak. And in this, Francis is declaring Baba's avatarhood poetically. But notice that the very first lines call you invoke the image of Kailash and Shiva and the Ganges River and Parvati. Uh, now, what is all of that about? Well, let's take a look at some of the uh, at the place that he's talking about. There this map uh, shows Mount Kailash. It's actually now in China. It's a little bit north of Nepal, close to the border, but a 21,000 foot mountain. And it's sacred in a number of the religions. Uh, the particular connection that Francis makes is uh, with Shiva, Lord Shiva, uh, who is regarded as the personification of God by a great many Hindus among Shaivites. Francis treats Shiva as God himself 
and also as the primordial avatar. That's another use of it here. And uh, the image that he calls to mind is of Lord Shiva on the summit of Mount Kailash with his consort Parvati, a very, another very famous goddess uh, within Hinduism who everyone in India would be familiar with. Um, here are some images of what uh, Mount uh, Kailash looks like. You can see it's quite an impressive mountain standing all alone. Um, here in slide nine, you can see it with uh, the lake um, in front of it, Lake Manasarawar, it's called. Uh, Francis uses this lake a great deal also, and the myth of the swan, Hansa, swan of Manasarawar, uh, as a symbol of the soul on the sixth plane who sees his own image reflected in the waters of the lake. So the Lake Manasarawar and the Swan of Manasarawar is another part of this thematic complex. Here's another uh, slide 10 where you can see uh, the lake once again and the mountain behind it. Um, here's slide 11 once again, another image of the mountain and the lake. Uh, many people even today do pilgrimages around it. I'm just going to scroll through some more of these images, um, 14 and 15 and 16. You can see it's quite a desert uh, environment up there. So Francis uses the Shiva and Parvati image in these opening lines of Stay With God. He also uses the myth of the Ganges River. He says, Shiva gentled Ganga. And I'll be explaining that more fully, the Ganges River, uh, its descent to the earth. Um, so right from the beginning, he's established some of the most important thematic complexes about the, uh, um, that will be used throughout the poem. Now, the myth of the descent of the Ganges, let's go into that. So here you can see in this slide uh, pictures of this and in the next slide also. And here is the story from Puranic literature. Um, there was a King Bhagirat who did penance for a thousand years in, back in ancient India. You do penance for quite a long time to save his 60,000 uncles back in ancient India. They had very big families uh, who had been under a curse from the, the Rishi Kapila was his name. Uh, they Anyway, they had offended him. There's a whole story behind this. Um, accused him of stealing a horse in a horse sacrifice. And he was so angry that he put a curse on them. And uh, they were burnt to a crisp. So King Bhagirat wanted to save his uncles, his ancestors who were under this curse. But to do so, the only way that it could be accomplished would be if the river Ganga, which was a heavenly river, were to descend to earth. Um, but if the Ganga came straight down onto the earth, it would destroy the earth through the impact of its fall all the way from heaven. So uh, King Bhagirat went to Lord Shiva and asked him if he would sit beneath the waters and break the waters the flow of waters on his dreadlocks. You know what Shiva looks like. You can see some images of him. He's a rather frightening looking character oftentimes. Um, very rich, deep, complex character in Indian religion. And he did that. So the river Ganga come, was broken on his de dreadlocks and flowed from there into the Ganges River that we have now. Francis uses that story, that myth, and I'll just anticipate one of his uses is the avatar breaks the descent of God's grace if it came directly to the earth would annihilate illusion, would destroy the world, but the avatar breaks it through his own form and makes it a mercy and a grace to the world. So you can see, going back to the opening stanza, which we read, Wings Towards the Glaciers of Kailas, where he says, and Shiva gentled Ganga. What that means was he made the descent of the river Ganges gentle. 
And after that had been accomplished, and Parvati walked by streams of living heart. You see how beautiful that is? Once it's been made into a beautiful, smooth river, his beloved consort Parvati can walk by the streams of it, and the two of them can enjoy it. So that's one early illustration of his use of this theme. Now let's go to another. Um, this is later on. Um, the first, uh, Stay With God has five books. He calls them books. And the first book is a biography of Baba from birth until 1955, which is when Baba gave Francis the order to write Stay With God. So he concludes with that. This particular section of it uh, is um, uh, right at the transition into the new life. And there's a kind of a lyric interlude. I'm going to read some little parts of it. We could spend a whole hour just on this because this is a, a extraordinarily beautiful poetry, in fact. Uh, I'll just, from the beginning of this section, he's doing the transition of time, the movement of time. He says, Sunday and moon month, time, our master, and the master's slave had now crept in decrepitude at his blessed feet, honoring him for 28 years. In other words, it's, 20, it's about 28 years since he, his mission began, and so forth. Next stands up. Um, in fact, I'll, in the interest of time, jump right down to the bottom stanza on this page. He says, on Kailash, Shiva endlessly enjoys his existence, knowledge, bliss. That's English for Satchitanand. At Chidambaram, he dances the world into being and gloriously sustains it. And in the burning grounds fired by Agni Hephaestus, he destroys it. In other words, Shiva is the creator and he's the destroyer. Chidambaram, by the way, is a temple in uh, South India uh, that has many, many famous sculptures of uh, Shiva, Lord Shiva, and Francis refers to it a lot. Um, going to the next page where he continues this, God alone knows what any of us are trying to say. His dance has brought confusion upon us. We are intoxicated by the movement of it. Now I just want to show you this image on the next page. These are Lord Shiva in another of his aspects as Nataraja, the Lord of the Dance. Nataraja, which is much depicted at this temple at Chidambaram that he just referred to. Through his dance, he creates the entire universe. And then he preserves it, and then he destroys it. You see? So he's developing this image of Shiva and the role of Shiva. Um, we are intoxicated by the movement of it. Would that we were drunk by his beauty, then would our hearts be Chidambaram and the burning ground of our desires. At Chidambaram, the dance creates the universe and the fire destroys the universe. Shiva Baba, Shiva Baba, we have caught a ray from your eyes light. Send fire to burn out the dead stump of our life's tree. If we are not willing to be consumed by your love, how can we lay down our lives for you? Isn't it? It's moving lines. Okay, I'm going to keep going for two stanzas. Now look at this. Look at how he uses the image of Shiva breaking the waters of the Ganga, right? This is a poetic development of this idea. Most copious are his tears. This is Shiva Baba, the avatar. The tears of each one who weeps. Ganga herself falling from heaven and coursing down his cheeks and filling the five oceans. Do you get the poetic idea? Shiva is allowing the river Ganga to be broken, and then it flows down his cheeks out of his weeping in compassion for the suffering of the world. Isn't that a beautiful way of interpreting this myth, this legend? So we have Baba. Then he says, a man of sorrows. 
Baba's deep, profound suffering, which is embodied. I don't know. This is an exquisite use of this Ganges uh, story. It is his sigh that fills the reed flute of each heart, causing the sweet music of lips and eyes and children's dancing. Krishna Jesus Baba, where your feet have trod on this earth and the plains through heaven, plant thou my feet and bring me home, but not before your work is done. So there he concludes this little interlude. So you see how he's taken this idea of Shiva and he's taken one aspect of it here. And he's developed it in this wonderful way, showing the avatar's tears of compassion like the waters of the Ganges rolling down his cheeks. I don't know. I find this to be extremely, extremely touching. Okay, here's another use that he makes of the uh, Kailash... Uh, legend, the Kailash story. Um, I'm just going to read this. This is from uh, the fifth book. In the fifth book, he really starts talking about art. And all of a sudden, he gives this stanza, which you can see on the slide. He doesn't say who says it, but I'll tell you who says it in a minute. This, I'll tell you right now, it's Hamza, his, uh, who was a great devotee of Lord Dadatre, the Brahma Vishnu Mahesh, quote, The sun was setting over Sri Kailash. I bowed to the four directions, spread my tiger skin on the ice, planted my staff on the right, and cried, Victory to the Lord, my master! Then sat in Sadasana, facing north, fixing his glorious image between my eyes. Cruel winds, bitter cold, snow up to my chest, but unbounded love defeated these enemies. On the third day, Lord Dadatreya, in his physical form, came to me, and picked me up as a child, and caressed me. Manas merged into Antakarana, Antakarana into Chitta, Chitta into Bodhi, into Ahamkara, and all into the Satchitananda of the Supreme Self. Francis here is boiling down into one stanza uh, about three or four pages uh, from this book uh, that was written. You can see here the image of the English translation of the book. It's called The Holy Mountain uh, by Bhagavan Sri Hamsa, and uh, it was written in Marathi originally, and uh, here it, Hamsa, here's from my slide from the new glossary, <clears throat> um, he in, uh, did a pilgrimage to Kailash in 1908 and wrote this Marathi book about it, and it's an extraordinary story. I was blown away when I read it, um, because he was from a very rich family, and his family did not want him to become a seeker of God. They wanted him to go into business or whatever. But he fell in love with Lord Dadatre, and he was bound and determined to get Lord Dadatre's personal physical darshan, which he conceived to uh, be, uh, be up in Mount Kailash. There is a little pond, a tarn, up at about 18,000, 17,000 feet, on Mount Kailash called Garakund. And he wanted to go up to this pond and meditate until he got the physical darshan of Lord Dadatre. And it's a very moving story. The simplicity, I mean, he's a smart guy, I mean, well-educated and everything, but the profound simplicity of this fellow, you can see his image there uh, right on the cover. And all I mean, those days traveling up there was a dangerous deal. He was practically killed by decoits and all these things. Here's a little bit. I'm going to read a little bit from his account. And you can see that Francis was boiling it down. He says, Gaurakund stands at a height of about 20,000 feet above sea level and is a natural lake about four furlongs in circumference. What's that? Half a kilometer 
or so around. The peak of Mount Kailash seems to be about 10,000 feet above this lake. Okay, now it's his meditation. He was all alone and it had every prospect of freezing to death. He says, everywhere here was snow and ice, snow and ice. My lips became green and blue with the severe cold. My nerves seemed ready to burst and respiration was extremely difficult. I was the solitary being in this place. Streams of ice from over the Kailash peak descend down into Gaurakund, etc. Jumping a little bit. Here on this lake, uh, my object, which I had cherished all these long years, was fulfilled by the loving grace of Sri Sadguru, my master. My joy knew no bounds. The darshan of Sri Kailash, Lake Manas, and Gaurakund uh, carried away all the strain and stress of the journey, and so forth. Next paragraph. My ideal was to have a sight of the physical form of Lord Dattatreya himself and to get myself initiated into the realization of the self. I began by looking in all four directions and then spread my tiger skin on the icy floor of the lake, planting my staff on the right. I again looked at the sky at, on, and at Mount Kailash, crying, Victory, victory to the Lord, my master, and so forth. You can see Francis quoted, uh, paraphrased a lot of this. The first night I experienced terrible hardships, bitter cold, piercing winds, incessant snow, inordinate hunger, and deadly solitude combined to harass my mind, etc. I mean, it's a beautiful account. Then he says he succeeded in subjugating uh, his mind and bearing through all of this. Then he said, I thought I heard a voice. I did not want to lead my meditation. And the voice was saying, oh, my child, oh, my child. And he was hearing this voice speaking, but he was not content to hear a voice. He wanted the physical darshan of Lord Dadatre, so he wouldn't even open his eyes. And he knew that as long as he had the image of Lord Dadatre in his mind, he couldn't see the Lord Dadatre himself. At last, all of a sudden, the mental form disappeared. Automatically, my eyes were opened, and I saw, standing before me, the Lord Dadatreya, my master, in his physical form. At once, I prostrated myself on the ice like a staff and placed my head on his lotus feet. Then he says, My master lifted me up like the Divine Mother and hugged me to his breast and caressed me all over the body. And then he gave him a mantra, and then um, Hansa says, here my manas merged into antakarana, the heart. The antakarana with the manas merged into the chitta, mind stuff. And the chitta along with the antakarana and manas merged into the buddhi, intellect. The buddhi with chitta, antakarana and manas merged into ahankara, egoism, and the ahankara, along with the buddhi, chitta, antakarana, and manas, all merged into the absolute Brahma. Now, if this really happened, what he's talking about is God realization. It certainly must have been a very high order experience. And Francis treats him as a God realized person or as a very high order person. Um, so you see how he's using Mount Kailash here in a new way. We've had, you know, the legend of Parvati and Shiva and the Ganges River, and you have the mountain and all of that. Now you have, just in the very early part of the 20th century, an actual living human being who went there and had the highest order of experience. So it's actually the living experience of Lord Dadatre, it means God, that uh, is the goal of life. So now Francis has developed the idea of, Ka you see, he's taking a poetic figure, Kailash, Mount Kailash, and he's developing it in all these wonderful ways. 
Well, here's the, um, by the way, the name of the guy, Hansa, it, it, one of its meanings is swan, a swan. And remember the Lake Manasarawar? There's a whole episode in his book about his being on the shores of Lake Manasarawar. And the swan of Saint Manasarawar is one of Francis's major uh, poetic symbols. Well, here is the last major use which Francis makes of Kailash, and it's a different form of it this time. He now wants to talk about the Kailash temple in uh, the Allura Caves. Baba visit, you know the Allura Caves, about, what is it, 100 kilometers from Mirabad, one of the glories of world art, I would say. These uh, And the uh, gr most important single temple is the Kailash Temple. And now the last book of Stay With God is about, of his five books, is on the subject of art, what art should be, which is as a path to God and for the glorification of God. And he uses that temple and the magnificent sculptures in it as the very emblem of what true art is. That is what art should be dedicated to the glory of God. He uses it this way throughout the entirety of Stay With God. So here are some images of uh, uh, slide 41. I'll just scroll through some of these. You can get a glimpse of what these temples, uh, the Kailash temple looks like. Um, one could spend a whole year here. Eric used to take us here and explain a lot of the things. This is slide 46. 47, 48, um, um, with all these panels and relief carvings profoundly meaningful. Uh, well, here is uh, Francis used, so uh, let me read from uh, the glossary enter entry I have here. Kailash, a central symbol in Stay With God, has two distinct references. The first is Mount Kailash, a 21,000-foot mountain in Tibet, held to be sacred in several religions and regularly circumambulated by pilgrims. I think it's about 25 miles to go around it. People, it's doable. Myths associating Mount Kailash with Shiva and Parvati are, are cited in Stay With God, which takes the mountain as a symbol of the Axis Mundi. The second referent is the Kailash Temple in the Allura Caves, see Allura, near Aurangabad in Maharashtra, one of the artistic wonders of the world. Dedicated to Lord Shiva, the Kailash Temple is a complex of chambers and small halls of worship with panel reliefs and stone carvings of Shiva and other deities. In Stay With God, the Kailash Temple serves as an emblem of art in its ideal sense. So repeatedly he brings it up. And throughout this whole of book five, Francis is constantly talking about what art should be and what it has fallen to, how it has lost itself. It's lost its true sense of purpose. So uh, in page 139, you'll just, just a casual reference. He says, at Allura, they have cut living memorials to God in stone. And then he continues in that way. Well, here's a, a, another passage where he contrasts the Kailash Temple carvings as uh, the very exemplification of art in the very highest sense with what he regards as fallen art. And he takes his, his uh, model here, uh, a painter who's a genius, everyone acknowledges that, um, uh, Pablo Picasso. So Francis is going to compare uh, the Kailash temple and the kind of art you find there with uh, one of the very famous paintings by Pablo Picasso called Guernica. Now Pablo Picasso is recognized by everyone to be an artistic genius, and Francis does also. But he feels that the, a lot of the genius of modern art has lost its high purpose and is no longer dedicated to the highest goal. Um, so now, 
the painting of Picasso's that he's going to be using in the passages I'll read is called Guernica. And that's a town, this is from the glossary entry, a town in the Basque region of northeast Spain that became the target of a ruinous and sanguinary attack by the Nazi Air Force in April 1937 to the outrage of the international community. In the months after the bombing, Picasso created and unveiled a very large painting, Guernica, three point three and a half by seven and three quarters meters. That's a really big painting. That captures the horror and the pity of the event. It is widely hailed as one of the supreme artistic protests against man's cruelty to man. So I'll just very quickly put up, here's an image of Guernica in Picasso's own style. It means to show the horror of wanton, cruel violence of war. Okay, Great painting in, in modern art, as most uh, um, literary artistic art, um, historians would say. Well, here's what Francis, he's going to compare. You see, protest is not the highest form of art at all. The high, art should be dedicated to God and not complaining about the wrongdoings of other people. So here's the stanza he writes about this. So he's taking very great art in the worldly sense that has lost its high sense of calling with true art, the Kailash Temple. He says, no doubt, as Shankara pointed out, all songs are to Brahman, God. And so it could be asserted that all expression is art. But some songs are the long way round, the round of the rounds of a few million, perhaps, more births. And some are a, direct, are a flight direct to the heart of God. Just as all men are drunk, some with love for the world, some with love for God, which is just the difference between your caged crooner and mud painter and violent poet in a Mirabai or Sappho or Chadi Baba. He's been talking about this earlier in this book. Now he's going to use Guernica and Kailash as his two opposites. Guernica is parochial. Shiva Bhairav at Kailash, universal. Guernica, the rage of man against conditions imposed by others. Kailash, the destruction of self-imposed objects to self. Guernica, an expression of barbarism destroying itself. Kailash, the expression of a civilization continually renewing itself. Guernica is reflection. Kailash is a statement. See the difference? Guernica is just giving a reflection of the horrors of the world. Well, what good does that do? It's not enough just to reflect Maya. You have to show the path to God, which is what Kailash does. So you see, this is the last of these examples of Kailash. All the different ways that he has used this symbol poetically as a myth of Shiva Parvati up on the top of this gorgeous mountain. By the way, I didn't mention a mountain itself is the vertical axis. And the last book is, uh, used, that's the Kutub. The, uh, the perfect master is the pole or the axis from earth to heaven. The very mountain symbolizes that. And you have Shiva Parvati, the two aspects of God embodied there. You have the grace of God as the river crashing down and being gentled by the loving Lord Shiva. Um, you have this man, Hamsa, who as an actual man in the 20th century had this experience there. You have this beautiful image of the tears flowing down the cheeks of Shiva, Baba, and then you have this use of the same thing for art. This is an illustration of how Francis uses his references. And, and if you know what he's talking about and put them together, the poetic power of what he says is enormously increased. Okay, I'm just going to give a few other short examples. And these short examples, so I could talk about at great length is what we've talked about already. 
Um, here's one. He uses a lot of uh, references um, to Norse literature. That's the uh, literature of uh, Iceland. And um, here's an example from page 150 about a character named Gunnar. Uh, now, Gunnar is uh, one of the leading characters in a book called the Njal Saga, 13th century. I would say it's the great held to be the greatest of all the Icelandic sagas. And here's some of the background about Gunnar. This is a world of farmers in Iceland who, uh, when they take a vacation, become Vikings and go out and loot and pillage. So you see that world from the inside. I'm being a little facetious, but it's quite true. These are Vikings. You know what Vikings are, right? So uh, Gunnar is a farmer, but he's also the greatest warrior of his time in every department, in everything he's the best. But he's a man of great nobility, of character, and he doesn't like to kill. But because of his greatness and his reputation, people keep provoking him and he has to fight and he has to kill them. Time after time, this has happened against his will. And he has a friend named Njal, uh, the Njal Saga, uh, who is like a saint, you might say. Um, Njal always knows what is going to happen. He's prescient. And they are deep, profoundly uh, good friends, Njal and Gunnar. Well, Gunnar has been involved in all these killings, and there's been a, a trial, you, the all thing it's called, and the verdict is, even though he's completely innocent, he couldn't do anything else. The verdict anyway was that he had to be in exile from Iceland for three years, and then the whole deal would be cleared. And Njal tells him, Gunnar, if you leave and do this, you'll be completely welcome in Norway and Denmark, where you go to. You'll get high honor there, and when you come back, you'll live peaceably for the rest of your life and die an old man. Now, Gunnar knows that everything Njal says is true. And so it looks like Gunnar is going along with it. But you know what? Gunnar is sick of it all. He's sick of this world and its falsehood. And at this stage in Stay With God, Francis is saying, the time comes where you just have to take your stand and let the world go its own way. So here's his stanza that he has to say, that I'll read this out. A man will journey so far and then quietly, or in a heroic spasm, examine what he has collected and say with Gunnar, this is my fall. Now I will not journey any whither to satisfy obsolete law. Fair is my house set in the meadows and the corn ripe to harvest. Soon will this house be laid in ruins under a great battle, and she whom my soul loved betray me for small spite. Great glory would there be for me in fulfillment of their law, but I, undefeated yet in fight, am weary of men's honor and am called by God to the battlefield of Sigurd and other great heroes pressing strenuously the way back to our father. Now here's what happened here, is Gunnar was about to leave with his brother and go in three years exile, and he's riding on his horse, and his horse trips, and he jumps and lands on his feet, and he looks back and he sees his farmstead, and it's springtime and beautiful flowers, and it's just so gorgeous, and he says, I'm not gonna go, I won't go. And his brother says, well, you know if you stay, you'll be killed. And Gunnar says, I don't care. So his brother leaves. And then because he's an outlaw now, a big party of about 50 men attack his house. He knows he's going to die. Njal has told him so. And, uh, but he's such a great warrior, they can't kill him. He keeps shooting them with his uh, arrow. He's in his house. And he's got this horrible wife, one of the most horrible characters in the whole thing. She has been the cause of all kinds of people dying just because she hates them. And at one point where she caused a bunch of men to die, um, Gunnar was in love with her at first, but she's turned out to be one of the villains of the story. Um, he's ki killed a close friend and Gunnar slaps her finally 
And she says, I will remember this and pay you back. Well, they're in the middle of the fight and his bowstring breaks. And he says, uh, Helgard, give me a lock of your hair so that I can make a new bowstring. And she says, does anything, does it matter? And he says, as long as I have my bow, they'll never be able to defeat me. And she says, in that case, I would like to remind you of the time you slapped me. <laughs> and he says, everyone has their own way of earning fame. I'm not going to ask you again. He fights and is killed. So uh, thus he says um, in those lines that I read, and she whom my soul loved betray me for small spite. See, So you have this great noble character who says, I won't play the world's game anymore. I won't do it. This is my stand, this is my fall. If I die, I die. It's a great moment in the Nial Saga. And if you know what Francis is talking about, this whole passage becomes a tremendous evocation of the truth. In your soul's journey, at a certain point, you have to say, I am for God now. Nothing will cause me to serve the world anymore. This next reference I'm going to talk about is from Homer, uh, who Francis cites a lot in Stay With God. He seems to feel that Homer was a perfect master. He treats him as such. This stanza that I'll be reading here from page 123 is one of the important moments in Stay With God again. It's uh, the first time where Francis uses the phrase, stay with God. So let me read this stanza. And the, the relevant lines are the last three. If you don't know who he's talking about, you'll miss it completely. So I'll read it and then explain what it means. Return, O man, O brother and sister of me. Return, O myself, before the tide turns at his speaking, and we are carried by his Noah's flood, witherward like fools, drunk in an open boat on the ocean, to the way of art and God. Stay with God, for he is not only the almighty creator, but our brother and friend. His counsel is better than the wit of men, for he is deathless and men are born to die. He is knowledge and existence and knows all the paths to him and leads those by the short path who surrender their path to him. He stirs up and urges forward. He retards and holds back to the right time. He drives one on to glorious victory. He hurls another into defeat. Andromache shall not receive of thee, Hector, Pelides' glorious arms, for this would be to rob Thetis of the victory whom God had promised. Now, if you don't know who those names are, you won't get it at all, but it's a tremendous example. This is from the Iliad, one of the greatest works of Western literature. I would put the Iliad and the Odyssey as the two greatest personally. And uh, Hector, the, the, the Iliad is about a battle between the Achaeans and the Trojans. They're, the Achaeans are trying to besiege Troy and recover Helen of Troy, who uh, was eloped with um, the son of the king of Troy. So um, the greatest uh, warrior of the Trojans is Hector. He, and uh, his wife, her name is Andromache. And... Um, Pelides, that's the father of Achilles. The son, the son of Pelides means Achilles. Now, everybody knows Achilles is the greatest warrior of the time without any competition at all, but he's withdrawn from battle. And his mother is Thetis. Thetis has won the promise from Zeus, the king of the gods, that the Trojans should wipe out the Achaeans until such time as Achilles returns to battle. This is a whole complicated story that I won't review. But 
everybody knows that Hector and Achilles are going to fight with each other at the end. And actually, everybody knows that Achilles is going to kill Hector, even though he's the second greatest warrior on the scene. Well, there's a moment early on where Andromache, uh, where Hector is coming back from battle. And Andromache, his wife, comes rushing up to him with their little two-year-old baby. And uh, she's... Uh, it's one of the most touching scenes in all of the Iliad where she says, oh, I, she's terrified that he's going to be killed. She, it, the love between husband and wife is so touching here. And she says, oh, I, I, I don't have anyone but you. All my brothers were killed by this horrible man, Achilles. And if you're killed, where will I be? Um, listen, here's some, don't go there to fight. Go up to this place right by the battlements and fight from there. Her obvious purpose is she wants him not to be in such a dangerous place so that he doesn't get killed because she adores him. This goes on, this quite long, and Hector uh, replies in such a moving reply. He says, basically, he knows he's going to be killed. He basically says so. And he says, I'm not so sorry uh, for my father I'm fighting for or my brothers or my family as I am for you because I know that after I die you'll be taken captive and become a slave and you'll have to draw well from the wa from somebody else's well water from the well and they'll say oh there's Andromache she was the wife of the prince of uh, Troy and look at where she is now and you'll Bitter will be your tears and there'll be no consolation. And this is what hurts me more than anything. But my role is to be in the front of battle and I will never be a coward in battle. And by the time this happens to you, I'll be dead. It's such a touching, moving scene. And then as he's about to go, his little baby is there and he wants to kiss his baby, but he's got this helmet on. And the baby goes, ah! The baby is terrified because of the helmet. And he takes off the helmet, and then the little boy recognizes him, and uh, Andromache and Hector laugh, and he goes back to battle. It's such a touching scene, and it makes you feel what a wonderful man Hector is. What a wonderful woman. Why don't they win? Why don't they win, you see? So when he says, Andromache shall not receive of thee, Hector, Achilles' glorious arms. It's not in his destiny. God knows what's best for everyone. Even though Homer has shown the losers in this battle in very appealing way as wonderful people, it's not his time. God knows what is best. So you see, if you know what Francis is referring to, this is such a charged moment. He's picked as the losers in this extraordinarily noble and appealing people. The first book of Stay With God has a major section on Baba's work with the musts. And to introduce it, Francis uses a long extract from Homer's poem, The Odyssey. Those of you who have read it will recall that he has tremendous difficulties and adventures returning from Troy to Ithaca, where he encounters all kinds of different monstrosities of every kind. Francis construes this as a representation of the trials on the path to God. So I'll read uh, one stanza from this. Um, he's talking about your... Uh, pilgrims who have left the harbor of men and have brought the war to a successful conclusion, that's the sack of Troy, which Odysseus was the key to, and set sail for home over the trackless seas. Home is with a capital H. Some are detained in that land whose fruits contain forgetfulness. This is the land of the lotus eaters. When you eat the lotus fruit, um, you forget about your desire to remain home and just go on eating lotuses. This is like samadhi. This is the samadhi state of yogis. Um, some are, sit in the giant's cave, plotting his blinding and their escape. This is the episode with the cyclops, Polyphemus in Odysseus. Some are being royally feasted by Aeolus, master of the winds and music. 
Some are engaged in mastering the Tantra of Circe. This is a famous episode, and he interprets it as the mastery of the Tantric path. And some have arrived at the island of King Alcinous, provider of winged ships. King Alcinous can take you anywhere in the world in a single night. Francis uses him as a symbol of the perfect master, and that's how Odysseus gets home. So this gets greatly developed, but he goes over all of this at length. And the one other thing that I wanted to, uh, to uh, call attention to was is his use in this section of uh, a very well-known epic convention uh, called the Catalog of the Heroes. Um, in uh, all of the great epics from Homer onward, uh, there'll be long pages and pages where he'll list who all the heroes were and who they came from. Well, we moderns might laugh at this, but you know, in sports events, we do it at the before the beginning of a sports event, number 62 at, the, at this position, you know, and people like it because in these wars, if you lose, man, you're finished. And if you win, you have you know, great prospects in view. And these warriors are putting their life on the line to win or to lose. So people take great interest in them. What does Francis use? Musts. The musts are the heroes. So he has a catalog of the musts. So I'll read a little bit from his, I won't read much, but see, he's using a great epic convention, um, but instead of warriors, he's using the warriors for God, the pilgrims of the path. He says, there was Muhammad, singer with a voice of sweet thunder, which melted hearts when he sang of Baba and his rescue of souls from the terrible ocean. And Pulwala, who used to weave garlands of flowers and adorn himself and who Baba said, with one slap, could knock you up unto the sixth plane. And Pulakolo Baba, king of all musts, aged 120 years, and so forth and so on. So he has several stanzas of this. So you see here he has the catalog of the musts showing them. He's just like saying to the people, who are the real heroes in this world? These are the real heroes. And it's with these people that Baba devoted the central part of his work in the 1930s and 40s. So this, in summary, these are just a few examples of Francis's use of references. And uh, when you study, if you get into the deep study of Stay With God, it's worth unpacking these things. Baba spoke so highly of Stay With God. He was, said it was second only to God Speaks. And a lot of the power of the book lies in these little references, sometimes just a name. And if you know what he's talking about, the book becomes much richer. I hope and I am sure that in future decades and centuries, Stay With God will be studied by people all over the world, and all these things will become part of the commonplace knowledge of the culture of a new humanity. Okay, well, thank you very much, and it's been a real pleasure to join you down under, uh, and hope to see you all in person soon. So, Avatar Meher Baba Ki Jai.